Um, so I'm really excited, uh, not just to be at a conference, but to also have the opportunity to share a topic that I've been paying very, very close attention to over the last five years, which is addressable TV, connected TV, and OTT, um, and the opportunities for digital marketers to be better leveraging those tools to reach audiences that you might be leaving off the table. Um, at that conference and at many conferences, uh, the first speaker will, you know, kick things off with, you know, a, a lot of call and response. Um, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so enjoy your coffee, enjoy your tea. Um, I promise you don't have to put it down. Um, but I do want to start uh, with a little bit of audience participation, just so we can look around the room and sort of gauge um, where we all stand personally as consumers uh, with some of the topics I'm going to address today. Um, so by show of hands, if you don't mind, um, how many people in the room are already familiar with addressable TV? Okay, two people. Alaska is big on addressable TV. <laughs> um, how many people uh, are clear on the definition of OTT or over-the-top platforms? Alaska and I forget where you're from. Phoenix, Alaska and Phoenix for the win. Um, what about connected TV or CTV? Okay. <clears throat> now I want you to really dig deep, get a little honest. Uh, how many people here uh, still subscribe to cable television? You pay for a cable TV service. So about half of you, okay. A little, little less than half. Um, even if you've got cable, how many of you uh, raise your hand if you consume the majority of your content and entertainment through an OTT platform, think Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, HBO Max, Amazon Prime, you name it. So almost probably 75, 80% of the room here. I'll admit uh, it's not, not a massive data set, so we have to take, take our results with a grain of salt. Um, everyone that just had your hands up, put them back up. Uh, if you consume your entertainment through uh, OTT, um, keep your hands up. I just want to get a sense. Uh, keep your hands up if you are, sorry, keep your hands up. Only put them down. Only put them down if you're over the age of 50. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, over the age of 40. Everyone look around. Okay. Over the age of 30. Okay, so a lot of sticky hands with 30. Any 20-somethings in the room? Yeah, over the age of 25. All right, so let's 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 take stock of this, right? Uh, of anybody that just had your hands up, you can, you can put your hands down. You can put your hands down. Um, raise your hand if, and I'm really talking to my 20-somethings and 30-somethings, it seems like. Raise your hand if in your personal adult life, you have never ever paid for a cable TV? One, two, three, four. Not an insignificant portion of the room, okay? So this is one of those sort of gotcha moments we should all really be paying attention to. This is kind of a big deal. There's a pretty si significant subset of audience that are not just cord cutters, they're never corded. We never had paid cable TV. And advertisers, digital advertisers in particular, through some of these topics, really should be paying attention to that. Um, so who am I and why am I so interested in this? Um, Zach, thank you for the introduction. I'll try not to be too, too redundant. Um, but I am originally from the Boston area, but I've been living and working in New York City for quite a while. Um, over 12 years of marketing experience, starting as graphic designer. Um, and I was a small scrappy team at that point. So very quickly, I started adopting more and more, uh, marketing responsibilities, particularly through digital, uh, social media, um, web design, uh, email marketing, and then really digging into making things, um, you know, uh, go cross platform and, um, fit mobile. I've designed apps, I've you know, done UX video content, you know, publishing, media buying, um, you name it. I've had some sort of hand in it um, in a scrappy sense um, until 
I had the opportunity to join a programmatic advertising startup called the Exchange Lab. Uh, first started in London, later uh, moved to North America. I would lead the North America uh, marketing for them as they tried to get into the US and Canada. They were situated in Toronto, but we operated out of a satellite in New York. Um, and that, that's really where this addressable uh, TV story begins. Um, because at the time, um, it was really just starting to be a burgeoning opportunity for a lot of traditional uh, media agencies. And, and we were trying to work very fundamentally into that. So addressable TV is something I've been very, very acutely conscious of um, since 2018 when we started that initiative. Um, and then later on, as, as Zach mentioned, the startup was uh, fully integrated into Group M. Their proprietary technology was fully integrated into Group M. Um, and to put it bluntly, they told me to kick rocks, uh, which is fine. That's, that's the nature of a startup. Um, it, was, it was really fun while it lasted. Uh, but with that ad tech experience, it made really good sense jumping into uh, more of an industry role at the Association of National Advertisers. Their uh, addressable TV and addressable media specifically was always a through line um, that was omnipresent. Uh, Zach mentioned we helped to launch the Masters of Data and Technology Conference. Addressable media was always a well-attended breakout during that um, industry. Heads of Fortune 500 brands, uh, uh, chief marketing officers are really paying attention to the space right now. Um, and then later on, I helped to launch uh, the Partnership for Responsible Addressable Media, which um, I fully encourage you to look up, uh, partnershipforaddressablemedia.com. Um, it's not a pay-to-play situation. It's really the industry coming together to respond to Google's announcement of the elimination of cookies and Apple's elimination of their IDFA or ID for advertisers through the iPhone, uh, which really shook things up um, and particularly for a few ad tech companies uh, recently. Um, so take a look at them, see if you can get involved. Uh, we, we helped to build um, through over 400 brands, publishers, ad tech companies, uh, at first, over 100 business use cases of how the elimination of cookie and IDFA were going to shake things up and make it more difficult to add value to customers' lives. And we whittled that down to 50 much stronger business use cases that we would then go on to present to Apple and to Google as they were releasing their federated learning of cohorts or flocks. Um, so, that's really why I'm super, super uh, into and paying attention to addressable. Um, and throughout my presentation, I'll likely weave in and out of a lot of ad tech jargon um, with the poll this morning. I think this next slide will be particularly useful. I just want to cover some key definitions because like, look, look at this screen, OTT, CTV, DSP, CRM, DMP, PMP, SSP, OMG, it's like, it's, it's nuts, it's nuts. So I just wanna take a moment, sip your coffee, let's center around some of these key definitions. So as I go through it, we have a baseline to be able to talk about these things. Um, so OTT or over the top I mentioned, right? Think, think you're your content provider through a streaming platform. Netflix, Disney Plus, Amazon Prime, Hulu, Tubi, that's what we mean when we say OTT. Um, technically speaking, also other streaming services, YouTube, uh, YouTube TV, uh, Facebook Watch, these are also OTT platforms. Now, um, forgive me for reading exactly off the screen, but just so we cover it, uh, content access through the internet without the involvement of a television service provider. You can access Netflix through your computer, you can access it through um, uh, technically even a smart TV, uh, but that's not through a cable service. Um, fundamental difference uh, to connected TV. Connected TV and OTT uh, really hold hands and walk together a lot, but it's important that we understand that they're fundamentally different. Uh, and the fundamental difference is that connected TV really refers to the device enabling um, that connectivity. So an internet enabled device that connects to or is embedded in 
um, a television to support video content or streaming. Think any smart TV, Roku, Amazon Fire Stick, um, Apple TV, the box, right? That's what we, we mean when we say connected TV device. Um, a lot of those have their own streaming services within them that operate as over the top, but it's important that we recognize that they are technically different things. Um, linear TV, that is the easiest one here. That's TV as we know it and love it today. Um, traditional system in which a viewer watches a scheduled TV program when it's broadcasted on its original channel, um, cable TV, tune in at five for the news. Um, it's always on at the same time. Um, DSP, this is where we start getting more into, uh, really more into the digital marketing aspect and where these two roads collide. Um, so if you're not familiar, a demand side platform, software that enables buyers, right, brands, agencies, presumably everyone in the room here, um, to purchase spots from exchanges and publishers. So if you're doing any sort of, frankly, any sort of digital marketing or programmatic, you're doing it through a DSP of some kind. Um, SSP is supply side platform. So think SSP, supply, DSP, demand, right? SSP is I've got ad spots to sell. DSP is, hey, I wanna buy some ad spots. Supply side platform, software system that allows publishers to offer their available inventory to exchanges and DSPs. Um, I'll get more into this when I get to some more uh, tactical advice, um, but PMP is an important thing to be aware of, even just as an option, because if you're working uh, through various trade desks and DSPs, um, you might not be aware that this is even a possibility. Uh, PMP is a private marketplace. This is where a real-time bidding environment uh, where a publisher makes their inventory available uh, to select advertisers or buyers through invite only, as in you're developing a one-to-one -one relationship with your publisher and building out an ad buying process that benefits both of you and their reader or watcher, uh, et cetera. DMP, um, when we think DMP, really think about first party data. Um, data management platform that's a central system that houses and manages audience and campaign data, <clears throat> not to be confused with a CRM, which very similarly also houses uh, customer data, but CRM is much more geared toward um, sort of uh, information specifically about your customer, their relationship to your company, how they're interacting with you, um, and where they might fall in terms of intent in your particular sales funnel. Um, you can, you know, that's where your lead scoring is going down. Um, just fundamentally different from a DMP. DMP is housing everything. CRM is much more tactical. You can use that data and receive that data in more meaningful ways. Um, central repository for the information a customer company has on its customer contact base and enables you to manage interactions throughout the customer life cycle, right? Think HubSpot, Marketo, things of that nature. Um, I'd be remiss to also not provide some sort of definition for addressable TV. Um, so addressable TV as sort of the house on the hill that we're trying to reach, we're really talking about um, addressable linear TV. So imagine, imagine TV as we know it now, where we've got live content uh, being served at a scheduled time, that is of very high quality. Um, it can be in ultra high, ultra high definition. Um, but you're actually able to make data informed real time advertising decisions through first, second, and third party data. For example, you might be able to strategically target a particular ad to a particular geo if it starts raining. Um, you're able to leverage your own first party data and what you know about customers to have two houses side by side watching the same exact show where one house receives one advertisement, the other uh, house receives another advertisement. It currently exists. It is a very small subset of many marketers spend and for good reason. Um, there's a lot of technical uh, limitations right now to being able to achieve it at scale. And it's really just something as simple as households don't have the technology to enable this type of ad bidding 
at scale. Um, people have old set top boxes for their cable that don't allow for it. Um, but slowly that's sort of starting to change. And I hope I'll make a very strong case that if you start uh, experimenting with OTT and connected TV, you're really gonna future proof yourself and your efforts by understanding what's working in a streaming environment um, when that inevitably becomes available at scale, which I certainly believe it will. <clears throat> All right, so let's go back in time, um, going through, you know, sort of the, the, the meat and potatoes of the last five years of this space. So I mentioned um, I'm at this uh, programmatic advertising startup called the Exchange Lab, where you know, a subsidiary of WPP and our holding company is Group M. Um, one of our biggest calls to arms at this time, um, as I mentioned, was touring the country um, to different metropolitan hubs and meeting with rooms full of media and uh, advertising agencies. Now, this was, we weren't, we weren't charging for this. Um, these weren't necessarily partners of ours. Um, this was truly a, a grassroots effort to really just inform uh, media buyers that there are sizable shifts right on the horizon uh, when it comes to big tech, Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, that are going to pretty immediately start to upset what they view as uh, effective traditional TV advertising. And it's something they should be aware of. Being that we are programmatic advertising specialists, um, we're also pretty well equipped to help those companies start to integrate data into their TV advertising uh, mixed media plan. So one of the things we did um, was we would start with just an overview of some of the major players um, in big tech and in what we would view as traditional broadcast media companies. Um, and we would just look at the overall market share of these companies, um, sort of a David and Goliath story, right? Um, and I'd be lying if I said we, we weren't trying to, you know, incite some concern here. You, you look at these charts and you see Facebook, Amazon, Google, Apple, right, in the 300, 500, 600, you know, billion dollar market cap range compared to other companies that are really struggling with mergers to try to um, maintain market share. We're talking Warner Brothers and Time Warner Media, Fox, Paramount, Netflix, uh, Comcast, which acquired NBC Universal. Um, and then of course we have, you know, Disney is a massive powerhouse. So data here is from 2017. And we were looking ahead. Remember, we're, we're in the room. We're all you know, media planners uh, back in 2018. And uh, this should concern us. Um, I want to go through, as we look at this, just some of, the, some of the major shifts, mergers, acquisitions, and announcements that happened over the next few years. Um, one of the biggest ones, well, first, actually, it's, it's important to notice that uh, Connected TV and OTT are already well established, right? Netflix exists. Netflix is really a major, major player in this. At this time, right, uh, Warner Brothers has HBO. Um, Amazon already has launched Amazon Prime, but at this time, Amazon Prime, they weren't really, they weren't really investing too heavily into content. It was more just a sweetener for an Amazon Prime membership. Um, that would certainly later change. Um, Facebook had already announced their plans to start Facebook Watch. They had a deal on the horizon. It was about $90 million to start six news channels with the likes of Fox, BuzzFeed, Fox, and a few others. Um, so big tech is already eyeballing this. Apple TV as a set-top box already exists. Apple TV Plus does not yet exist, so they have yet to fully invest in their content library at this point. Um, in 2018, we also saw uh, one of the biggest deals ever attempted in uh, media and entertainment when AT&T purchased uh, Time Warner Cable. Um, 
it wasn't without a lot of uh, friction with the Justice Department citing um, anti-competitive concerns. Uh, they would actually go on to win um, an appeal against the Justice Department, but it was very contested. Um, that ripple effect um, of that of that acquisition uh, was was certainly um, on everyone's minds and felt uh, by advertisers all over. Um, Walt Disney World also Walt Disney World Walt Disney Company um, bought. 21st Century Fox, that was a 21, uh, 70, $71 billion uh, deal. Um, and that was specifically to expand their direct consumer offerings. Mind you, this is right before Disney Plus happens. So fast forward 2019, right? This is only you know two years after this uh, market share comparison exists. Um, it's 2018, we're sharing it with media companies. The following year, 2019, Disney Plus um, launches. And not only did Disney Plus launch, which you know everyone was really excited about, um, they also announced their bundle. Uh, if you're not familiar, their bundle includes Hulu, which is al already a well-established uh, OTT platform at this time. Um, but most critically, ESPN Plus. Now, live sports has really been a life raft for um, linear TV up until this point, right? Um, first of all, there, there aren't a lot of streaming options for sports content. Um, obviously, you know, especially in North America, uh, sports content is huge. Um, so a lot of people are maintaining their cable subscriptions purely because they want to watch their teams. Uh, they certainly want to watch NFL. NBA, MLB, and the likes of those. Um, and so this, this was a really strategic move on, on uh, Disney's part um, to incorporate uh, sports streaming. Now, one of, the, one of the benefits that Linear still has to this day is that Linear TV offers superior, um, superior uh, experience, right? You can have ultra high definition, big screen sports. I don't care how strong your Wi-Fi is, you cannot stream ultra high definition live sports in the same way. Um, so that's that's still a life raft. Um, but as the streaming services uh, start to get into the space more, and as um, more and more people start cutting the cord, um, it's it's something to be very mindful of, especially if you're trying to align your client or brand or product with sports content. Um, it's also in this year that Apple finally launches Apple TV Plus. Um, that, that was another big move. The following year, 2020, uh, now we finally have some data sets to go off of what's working, what's not working. Um, Disney Plus emerges as the fourth largest uh, SVOD uh, platform, which is streaming video on demand platform. Um, fourth place is not bad, but it's exceptional when you consider that they just launched um, just a year before. Um, at this point, they had about 73 million subscribers, which is really nothing to sneeze at. That's a huge, huge market. Um, what was surprising at that time in 2020 um, was going back again to ESPN Plus. Um, ESPN Plus emerged as the fifth largest. Um, they were the only sports streaming uh, service on that list. Um, and obviously significantly benefited from being included in that Disney bundle. Um, so also just something to consider. Um, 2021, just last year, uh, Amazon announced a $8.5 billion bid to purchase MGM, if you didn't see that news. So now Amazon is, hey, we're, we're missing out. We're getting in the content game big time. Let's buy a Hollywood studio. Um, that deal finally closed this year. Um, According to an annual report uh, filed, uh, Amazon also spent uh, $13 billion on music and video content back in 2021, and that number is expected to increase by $2 billion this year, putting them at a $15 billion investment into content. Massive. Um, I had previously mentioned the merger between AT&T and Time Warner. Um, 
HBO Max really lagging behind. It's not the silver bullet for uh, Time Warner Media uh, as they expected it would be. Uh, the uh, subscription numbers for HBO Max continue to lag um, behind Disney Plus and Netflix. They're roughly half of what Disney Plus has today and a fraction of that compared to Netflix. Um, huge, huge news uh, this year, just, just late last month, that if you weren't aware, now you are, and you should really take this um, back, to your, back to your boss, back to your board, and convince them to get more spent to start experimenting in OTT. Netflix uh, CEO recently announced that they will be introducing an ad-supported streaming platform on Netflix. First time they've ever done that. Up until this point, they've been uh, membership only. That's where their core revenue comes from. Um, but with the competition, they have all but plateaued in their new memberships. And frankly, there are not enough Stranger Things lunchboxes that you can sell to compete with Apple, Google, or Amazon. Um, so that's, that's something to be aware of. They, they announced that they expect it to roll out as soon as Q4 of this year. So this is happening now. <clears throat> um, the difference in market share, uh, we'll breeze right through this one. Uh, looking back at last year, um, big tech was on a huge, huge run until very recently, um, but it shouldn't really surprise anybody that um, the pace at which big tech continues to expand their market share just pummels uh, traditional broadcast media, which actually in some instances like Fox and Paramount have actually begun to decline. Uh, so what does that mean? What does that mean for us in the room? Uh, and what, what, what can we do about it? Oh, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. One more slide. Uh, recent recent uh, survey done by IAB. This is a survey that was done last year in 2021 on video ad spending in the industry. Um, as you're reading this, please note, it is hours and minutes, not minutes and seconds. Um, this is time spent per day on media, the black representing traditional linear TV over time, the red representing connected TV over time. Again, think Amazon Fire, Apple TV, um, smart TVs, et cetera. Um, slowly, slowly, but steadily, uh, the cord cutting revolution continues. People are dropping traditional uh, broadcast uh, cable and opting for more streamed media. Uh, 2023 here is their prediction. So now what does that mean for, for us in the room? <laughs> um, generally speaking, um, and this was always a constant through line um, with uh, our Masters of Data and Technology conference, the uh, Partnership for Re Responsible Addressable Media, and even other industry bodies um, uh, in uh, cross-media measurement. Um, there's a lot of frustration that continues with traditional TV. Um, aside from companies like Nielsen, who are long trusted sources of data and effectiveness in advertising, there, there's really not a whole lot of other uh, players that can provide that same level of trust and, um, and sort of data and results. Um, and there's a lot of frustration there. TV advertising continues to get more expensive. The results are blurry. Um, there's hardly attribution. People leave just as consumers, right? Let's take, take our marketer hats off for a second. We just, we just put the TV on to feel like we have company, right? It's background. We're numb to the advertising. Um, that's a problem. Um, and it's a big problem that, uh, that has really been a, a, a subject of concern for uh, Procter & Gamble's chief brand officer, um, also happens to be the chair of the board of the Association of National Advertisers, brand marketing guru. Um, he's really upset with uh, traditional media buying process and upfronts, um, equating it in a as latest media conference to uh, toilet paper. Um, what he, what he really meant by that was, you know, similar to as it was in the pandemic, which we all experienced, you buy as much toilet paper as you can when you're at the store because you just don't know how long you're going to be stuck at home. 
And the same rings true for traditional uh, TV buying. You buy as much as you can because there's a finite amount of slots, and then you figure out what to do with them later. And a big problem with that is the frequency is off. Um, we're, we're seeing, you know, advertisements are just on repeat. We see the same advertisement over and over and over and over again, and it's because of the inventory and the frequency. Um, and that, that's, that's a big problem. Um, so big, in fact, that Mr. Pritchard um, also claims that uh, through various uh, surveys and studies that the average consumer uh, sees roughly 10,000 ads per day, which I believe, um, I believe through all of our devices, that, that certainly adds up. Um, and that's, that's a big problem. Um, as digital marketers, right, that's the focus here, um, something we've always had in our back pocket is frequency capping as a tool and a tactic. And um, if you haven't been, you certainly should be. Um, through your campaign uh, building, you can set the frequency of when and how often your advertisement will be displayed. And that's a really powerful tool that does not exist with linear TV, but is promised with linear addressable TV eventually. If you're not already using frequency capping in your programmatic campaigns, you, you absolutely must. Um, <clears throat> now for the good shit. Um, that was all a lot of negative stuff. Uh, <laughs> with the rise of OTT and CTV, uh, digital marketers really should be getting more and more excited about what's possible. And this is where we can really put on our thinking caps and start to experiment, test, and learn. And I hope that uh, everything I cover here will continue to talk about throughout the rest of the day in various networking opportunities because it's all very interesting, very new, and there's no there's no silver bullet of oh if I you know have my ratio set up this way if I spend this much on CTV this much on OTT I'm gonna definitely uh, see a return. That's that's not the case. Every business is different. Uh, the intent of your customers is very different, but the opportunities are abundant. Um, I'm not saying lose linear TV if you already have that as a major spend in your campaign planning. I'm not saying that. The, the audience segment is still massive. I mentioned before the quality is still un, unsurpassed. Um, it's the place where you can do really effective storytelling if you're investing in really quality video content and entertaining people. Um, but it's a really good, big opportunity to start increasing your spend in CTV and OTT and see what works for you and perhaps even pull away a bit from linear TV to enable that. Because again, the shift is already happening. Um, it's whether or not you're going to be ready for it when it's available at scale. Um, if you're eager to start incorporating data into your uh, planning, um, there's a number of OTT platforms that make it very easy. Uh, not the least of which Disney Advertising recently uh, announced a partnership with the Trade Desk, if you're familiar with the Trade Desk. Um, and they're, they're basically taking Disney's audience graph and merging it with, if you've been paying attention to the Trade Desk's response to the cookie, uh, Universal ID 2.0, which is a universal digital identifier for consumers that can enable targeted advertising in a post-cookie environment. Um, they're working directly with the Trade Desk. Disney is supplying their customer data. Trade Desk is supplying their ad tech. And they're really building out new possibilities. And that's very exciting. Um, not the least exciting of that is that Disney has a first of its kind integration with their clean room uh, data sets, which means it's already cleansed customer data that they're working with and is very, very close to be ready to go to market as soon as they're willing to release it. It, it won't have to go through too much um, testing. Uh, and the brand safety aspect will be just tremendous. Um, Disney's not the only one. Um, Roku uh, makes it very easy. Hulu, Peacock, 
uh, Pluto TV and Tubi are also ad enabled streaming platforms you can very easily through um, if you work with a, a DSP or trade desk get into those or work directly um, with the publishers themselves. Um, but Roku in particular, a um, few years ago uh, purchased, you, you might remember DataZoo, um, XU at the end of that, Data XU, um, to form OneView. Uh, Roku's OneView is a self-managed um, OTT advertising uh, uh, platform. So you can set up an account. And what's really nice about OneView is that uh, the default is no minimum bid. You can start experimenting um, with a targeted campaign for as little or as much spend as you would like, and that's a really great way to start testing. Um, I've focused very heavily on OTT and connected TV. I mentioned before, really the reason why that is is because while addressable linear TV does exist, um, it's not getting the traction uh, companies, you know, en masse are not spending too, too much money, time, or attention on it. But as we see the cord cutting revolution continue, if you're not in over the top and connected TV in your advertising as an extension of your digital marketing, um, you're really going to miss out when it becomes available at scale. And I, I do believe it will become available at scale uh, relatively quickly, um, the way that uh, these tech companies are positioning themselves. Um, from a tactical standpoint, um, you know, some things to consider. <clears throat> you can leverage your first and third party data uh, for advanced targeting. This was a really, uh, even back in 2018, this was a, a really powerful um, tactic that we would recommend to a lot of clients <clears throat> at the Exchange Lab. Uh, particularly from a top of funnel brand awareness um, standpoint, right? Just take off the marketing hat for a second, put on the consumer hat, right? I'm sitting down at the end of the day to watch my favorite Netflix show, or maybe not Netflix in 2018, but watch my favorite, you know, Amazon Prime show. Um, I'm not really in a in a mood to convert, right? I'm not going to take an action, but I am interested in seeing what you have to offer, and it will give some share of mine if I've been entertained by it or learned something from it. Um, so you can leverage your first and third party data for advanced targeting, either through your uh, private marketplace uh, environment or through a trade desk and DSP. Um, things to consider, use your data to establish lookalike audiences. You can target at scale people that already exhibit traits as your ideal existing customer. Um, that's always a good one. Um, you can utilize personalization, especially through third-party data, and that doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, hey, Bill, I saw that you bought this thing. Oh, that's weird. Turn off. <laughs> Could even just be utilizing third-party data to recognize weather patterns, right? Recognizing that, you know, people are more apt to watch their show and uh, online shop when the weather is snowing or raining. Um, or perhaps if you're like me here in Hawaii, there's a tsunami warning. <laughs> uh, Environmental factors like weather, always powerful. Um, always consider your target demos um, through even if you want to get started in something like OneView, they offer very similar to, we've, everyone in this room has probably done a targeted Facebook campaign, right? Very similar idea. You can utilize things like age, interest, or if you're integrating it with a, a greater online campaign, right? You can utilize Google's. Uh, for or for the rated American cohort, interest, education, fee, etc. One thing that I will always say, and I will say this till I'm blue in the face, is don't make assumptions based on demographics. It's so much better and more impactful to make assumptions based on behavior. Um, you know, an, an example of that might be, you know, you are positioning a campaign toward a largely Hispanic audience. All right. Well, there is no one size fits all Hispanic, culturally very different. And you also can't assume that it's a Spanish speaking household. Right. These are all assumptions that uh, one might make entering a campaign like that. And you just simply should look at behavior. Is is there their uh, device set for Spanish language? And you should be able to do that in your campaign planning. Um, but it's just a consideration to make. 
watch out for the demo, do pay attention to behavior. Um, same thing with age. I know sneaker heads that are, you know, 65 years old. Not all sneaker heads are, you know, 20 somethings living in Portland. <laughs> um, frequency capping, I mentioned that before, critical tactic. Don't, don't bombard people with the same ad over and over again. At a certain point, it switches and actually has a negative effect on your, your uh, brand perception. Um, TV sync's a, a tough one. We used to use this back in 2018, super powerful. I used to love it. Um, if you use, um, if, if you're you know, using a third party, like a trade desk, um, talk to them about what's possible. Um, I'm not entirely up to speed uh, with how this has changed. TV sync is essentially, um, we at scale can identify people watching a particular program at a particular time and target digital ads during that time. How many of us uh, actually watch commercials on TV? How many of us actually just stare at our phone until the show comes back on, right? We can advertise here based on what's happening up there. Apple's elimination of IDFA has shifted that. Um, so something to look into, um, but as always, test and learn. Um, there's no silver bullet. You have to see what amount and demo and targeting criteria works for you and your company. Um, you'll be in very good company um, in uh, that same IAB uh, survey on video ad spending. Nine out of 10 advertisers say connected TV is a must buy. Um, that other person might also be that, that one out of five dentist that doesn't recommend that toothpaste. <laughs> um, so take that to the leadership and say, hey, everyone's doing it. We need to start experimenting with this ASAP. And as always, content is king. It doesn't matter how good your targeting is or your data integration is or your insights are. If your content is crap, then it's gonna fall flat on its face. Focus on adding value, education, entertainment to the customer always, period. Um, we've got one minute exactly for questions, um, but I will, two minutes exactly for questions, um, but I'll, I'll also you know, be here all day, so we, we, can, we can chat. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, it's, it's probably gotta be a combination of both, and I know that's not a desirable answer. Um, obviously, there are walled garden environments. That's you know, obviously a phrase we're gonna hear a lot over the next couple of days. Um, that's a huge hindrance um, is these platforms not necessarily talking to one another. Um, but where it makes sense if there's a particular um, publisher that really aligns fundamentally um, with what you're, what the, the message or the product that you're trying to convey, that would be a really good opportunity to approach a PMP relationship um, because it can be beneficial for the publisher as well as the advertiser and their synergy there. Um, with that, obviously, there's going to have to be some sort of minimum, um, you know, buy because, you know, they're, they're not going to want to, you know, enter, a, you know, exclusive agreement with you if you're not, you know, going to bring some money up front to the table. But if, if they really align with what you're trying to do, say, say, you know, you're in Alaska, you might really have some good alignment with um, discovery, right, and their content, that might be an interesting um, approach for a private marketplace arrangement. Did, did everyone hear that question? Because I think it's a really good one. Um, I didn't hear it. Essentially, essentially, they they're spend they spend a lot on traditional um, TV um, because connectivity in Alaska is iffy, um, and because of that, should the qual uh, should should the content itself be manipulated to perhaps be um, you know even like a lesser quality uh, in terms of uh, clarity to be able to be served. Uh, because the connectivity is bad. So if it's a high, high resolution or a long form content, it might not deliver in time. I think that's a really good question and a really good consideration. Um, I don't really know the answer to that. I think it would be something to test, right? Does, does shortening the content impact the response? Does um, reducing the visual quality of the content impact the response 
again, that's one of the things that traditional linear TV has the benefit of is, you know, not that it doesn't happen, but far more rarely do you end up with just a blank screen. If you've been on any uh, ad supported uh, streaming device, you've been served blank ads before, guaranteed. Um, but something to experiment with. It, I'd be curious, and I, I'm certainly not the expert, you'd have to talk some, to someone who's actually with the platform, but I'd be very curious how much of that is the content itself, and how much is the integration uh, with the DSP serving the content and that relationship because it has to go both ways. It's a, it's a send and receive. It's a request, send and receive, right? And if you're introducing any type of real-time bidding, um, that adds another layer of like speed diminishment that has to occur for that ad to actually be served and placed and is one of the big impediments to addressable TV currently. We are at time. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and thanks, uh, Digi, Digi Markle.